All right, I'm Runar. Uh, I'm going to be talking about injunctions. Uh, this is what we really talk about when we talk about moments, which, you know, we talk about a lot. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so about me, uh, I'm a lead engineer right here at TAX. Uh, in case you have heard, we're hiring. Uh, and I'm also an author of a book called Functional Programming and Scala. Uh, I promise there's no Scala in here. So. <laughs> okay, so adjunctions. Um, uh, I think it was uh, Saunders McLean who said uh, joint functors arise everywhere. I think wrong with that, who actually said that. But, um, but they really do arise everywhere within in mathematics and in programming and sort of in everyday life. Um, Wikipedia gives a sort of good motivation for like why we should care about adjoint functors. Uh, it says that uh, an adjoint functor is a way of giving the most efficient solution to some problem via a method which is formulaic. It sounds super cool. Uh, and we can read formulaic as maybe functorial. So we have a functor, uh, we can find an adjoint functor to find the most efficient solution to whatever that problem that functor represents. Or if we read them dually, we can say that we can find the most difficult problem uh, that is solved by some particular formula or that some functor solves. So the goals that I have with this talk are super um, selfish. I wanted to show you this pattern over and over in different settings and, and different uh, contexts and in different ways so that you will basically start seeing this pattern everywhere and you'll get super excited and you're going to tell me about all the cool injunctions that, that you discover in your work and in everyday life. Um, all right, so the first example I want to show is uh, is an example in Scala, uh, sorry, in Haskell. Oh, <laughs> in, uh, in Haskell, uh, so, uh, so, so there's this isomorphism in Haskell between curried and uncurried functions. Right? So if we have a function that takes a pair of A, B, and C, we can turn that into a partially applied, or a, a, we can turn it into a function that we can partially apply that takes a one at a time. Um, and conversely, if we have a regular function that takes an A to B, to see, we can turn that into a function that takes pair. All right, so nothing super mysterious here. Uh, but, but this is a, an isomorphism, so there's a one to one relationship between these two types. Right? Uh, so curry witnesses uh, the isomorphism go in one way, and uncurry witnesses the isomorphism go the other way. So uh, for every argument to curry, there's exactly one uh, response and, and vice versa. All right, so, so yeah, it's, it's this, these two types. Uh, you know, function from pair with A, B, to C, and A to B to C is end in a one-to-one -one relationship. They are structurally the same type. Um, but I want to say that uh, this is really a relationship between two functors. And the two functors involved here are pair with B and function from B. And I'm going to call those F and G. Right, so now when we abstract this out, this sort of pattern, what we have is uh, an isomorphism between Functors, uh, sorry, functions from f of a to c, and functions from a to g of c. So they stand in a one-to-one -one relationship like this. So what we what we say is that these two functors f and g are adjoint. We say that f is left adjoint to g. Uh, and so whenever we have like two categories like this, c and d, and in one in the category c we have an arrow from f of z to x. And in the other category, we have an arrow from z to g of x. And if they stand in this one-to-one -one relationship, we have an adjunction. All right, so that's sort of like what an adjunction is. It's an isomorphism on these, on these arrows that have this particular kind of structure. Uh, so in the case of curry and uncurry, uh, the, both of these categories, c and d, are both Haskell. So they're the category of Haskell types. Uh, and the arrows in that category are the functions between types. So, so then for every uh, function of type, you know, a pair s to b, uh, there is a corresponding function that goes from a to s to b, right? And the functors involved are pair with s and, and function from s, and pair with s is left adjoint to uh, function from s. Right? So that uh, shows this sort of pattern. Uh, and we can capture that in uh, type s in Haskell. So we can say that if we have two functors f and g, 
uh, we have a, a junction between f and g uh, if we can witness this isomorphism in both directions, right? So if we can go from functions from f to b to functions from a to g of b, then we can go the other way as well. Uh, and these, these functions are not calling the left adjunct and right adjunct. And I think that's actually the terminology that's used in the conjunction uh, library on um, average. So yeah, we can create an instance for our two functors here. And the implementation is super awesome. It's just current and uncurrent. Right? Um, we also get, when we have an adjunction, we get uh, two more things, uh, which are the unit and the co-unit. And uh, this unit is going to be a, a return or a cure for a monad. And the co-unit is going to be like a, a co-return or a, an extract for a co-monad. Uh, and we can get the unit and the co-unit completely mechanically just by passing the identity to either left adjunct or right adjunct. So, uh, and that always just, just works. Like that, that relationship is always supposed to work. And we can go the other way as well. If we know the unit and the co-unit, we can generate the left adjunct and the right adjunct. Just by, so the left uh, adjunct is, is just mapping uh, after applying the unit, and the right adjunct is mapping before applying the co-unit. Cool. Uh, so in general, uh, you know, we have two categories, C and D, like this. Uh, then, uh, uh, you know, if we apply, the, if we send the identity arrow across from, you know, from, from C to D, or we, we have the identity arrow in, in D, then uh, G of X collapses. And what we have is our co-unit, which corresponds to the identity function. So we have the identity function in, in D, or the identity arrow, sorry, in D, on G of X, uh, then the corresponding arrow in C is the co-unit. And uh, if we have the identity arrow on f of z in c, and the corresponding arrow sending that across the junction to, to d, we get the, the unit. All right, so if we, uh, we start at x, and then we go g into g of x, and then we go f into f of g of x, we don't end up at x. Right? f composed of g is not the identity functor. Uh, what we, where we end up with is somewhere where there's an arrow into x, sort of interesting. And then in the, on the other side, uh, if we go f and then g, uh, we end up at g f of z rather than z itself. So we end up at somewhere where there's an arrow into you know, where we, uh, uh, or there's an arrow from where we start. Right? So an arrow from z, so we don't, we don't uh, so g, g compose f is not exactly the uh, the identity. So it's a sort of approximate, uh, uh, it's sort of an approximation. Right? G of f is sort of a, an approximate identity in some ways. Uh, okay, so in, in co unit, in our case, uh, when we're talking about curry and uncurry, uh, the co unit is this uncurry of an identity, and the unit is this curry of an identity. Super easy. Uh, but something, something cool happens here. If you look at this type, on, uh, like for, for the unit, uh, the unit here in, in also ask goes from A to functions from S to pair of A and S. Right, so the implementation of that is going to be kind of obvious. Uh, it's, a, it's a function that takes two arguments, an A and an S, and it returns a pair of A and S. And how is it going to do that? Well, it's going to put them in a pair. Right? It's going to put the A and the S inside of a pair. It's a super uninteresting function. Uh, and then the co-unit uh, is going to go, uh, you have a pair, and you have a function that takes, takes an S and returns a B, and then you have uh, an S. And what the implementation is kind of obvious, you're gonna pass that S to the function to get your B, which is, uh, which is going to return. But uh, uh, that function, that unit, should be somewhat familiar to a lot of people. Right? So this is the, the return in the state mode. And then the other one, is a co-unit in the, or the extract, in the store co-monad. In the store what? Co-monad. co yeah. So, so a co-monad is a, a monad in the opposite category. Uh, I'll, I'll go into what co-monads are. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so this type, you know, function from S to pair of A, A and S, uh, it represents the state machine. 
So uh, the, the argument S is the state before the machine runs, so the input state. Uh, the return S is the state after the machine runs, so the output state. And then there's some value A, some value of type A, which is the, the output of the whole machine. Okay, so there's a state alphabet and an output alphabet. You know, sort of like it, this is a mealy machine. And then store, conversely, uh, it models a, a kind of store where you have uh, a, uh, a number of stored values of type A, and they're all indexed by the type S. So for every S, there's an A. And then there's a cursor into the store, type S, that selects sort of like the current S, or the, the current A. Okay. So if we take our, in, our cursor and we pass it to the, the indexing function, we should get uh, our A, our, our current A. Uh, so what's super awesome is that we can take this as a junction. And, uh, so we got our, our return for the, the state monad. But we can just sort of turn the crank up as a junction. And if we just map the co-units over the, the sort of outermost function, uh, we actually get the join for our state monad. So you can see that you know, this sort of complicated type like function that takes like two s's and it returns, uh, no, sorry, so it takes an s and it returns a pair. And the first half of that pair is a function that looks kind of like a state transition. And the other one is like the, the s, right? So you can see that as a, as a nested state machine, right? So it's a, you know, a state of S of state of S of A. Um, so that nested state machine means that, uh, so the outer state machine will run, give us an S, and it will return as its output value a new state machine. And then you can take the output state of the, of the old machine, pass that as the input state to the returned thing, and you can construct a new state machine that runs both of those, right? So that's the, that's the join in the state monad. But you can also see that the, the argument to this is a function that takes an S and returns a store. Right? So it, it's not necessarily, you don't, don't need to view it as a nested state machine. You can also view it as a function that returns a store. Right? So if we just map over that, that S argument, uh, we compose the co-unit with, uh, with that function, then we can extract whatever the current thing is from the store. And that you know, is the same thing as the joint statement. So, totally cool. Um, <laughs> you can, what? can you go back to the, the graph of the co unit? Can you show us like, what you're mapping over? So, you've got co unit here. Yeah. So, you're mapping that over a function to a store? Yes. Okay. So, the, uh, so the, the gray annotations there sh should show you what's going on here. Like the argument type to this, the first argument to join here uh, is uh, actually I'm missing a paren here. Uh, I should have a, an additional uh, paren around these. Uh, okay, and then uh, we have a duplicate for a store common uh, and that works exactly the same way. We just map the unit over. Whatever we have, and what, what we uh, have to have is a pair. Uh, one, you know, half of that pair is a function, and the other half is, a, is the S. If we map uh, over that, uh, what we're mapping over is the uh, is the function. I mean, the so pair is functorial in its first argument. Uh, so so then what we get here is uh, you know we we get a, a state machine that's full of functions from S to A, right? And that's the, the, the same as a store full of stores. So, and, and that's gonna be a store, like the store full of stores, it's gonna be a store where the cursor goes to like the store we started with, and then at every index, there's a store whose cursor is set to that index, right? It's, it's totally crazy. Um, Okay, so uh, let's, let's talk about monads here for a bit. So just a re reminder, so what is, a, what is a monad? So we ended up with a state monad. So what's a monad? Well, a monad is a functor uh, where we have these additional capabilities we can return into the, into the monad. So that's our, uh, our unit. Uh, and then we can join, which was our, our, our 
Oh yeah, all right. So we can go from our nested m to m of m of a to, to m of a. Uh, Komonas, uh, oh sorry, but in uh, Haskell, normally what, what you write is not like return and join and functor. Uh, what you say is is return and find. Uh, so uh, so normally you see monads implemented with, with, uh, with bind, but uh, bind is just uh, join followed by uh, the fmap followed by join. All right, so then uh, comonad is sort of the reverse of that. So instead of being able to return into our monad, we can extract from our comonad. Like in the case of store, we can extract the current value in the store. Uh, and instead of being able to join nested structures, we can take a structure and duplicate it. That is, we can uh, generate a larger structure. Uh, and then the analog there of bind is this thing called extend, which uh, we should sort of read this type. So it has a W of A, so it's some structure full of A's. And then if we have a function that can take a whole structure full of A's and give us a B, then we can turn our whole structure, a W of A, into a W of B. And the way that works generally is that you can imagine this, this uh, function from W of A to B operating sort of locally on some, some uh, neighborhood in our store. Then uh, extend will take that computation run it across the whole story. Uh, so in general, a comonad extends a local computation to a global one. And uh, I'm going to show you how that works here in a minute. Uh, so imagine if we had a store that is full of pairs of ends, and it's indexed by, by ends. Uh, well, I think that's actually the wrong way around. It's a store full of ends, <laughs> and it's indexed by a pair of ends. Okay, so this is now, uh, we can imagine this being a bitmap of grayscale values. So it's a two-dimensional bitmap, the index is two-dimensional, right, it has two ints. And it's full of, of integers, which are, you can imagine that's a, a grayscale value, right? So it's a two-dimensional bitmap. Uh, yeah, so, so then the, we're going to have a cursor into sort of like a current pixel in this bitmap, uh, and then given uh, you know, given any, any pixel, we can get out the, the value, uh, the color at that, at that pixel. Okay, so then we can imagine implementing uh, a mean function, which takes, you know, a, a, a bitmap like this, and we'll uh, look at the neighborhood surrounding the current pixel. Like we have a pointer into like a, a selected pixel, and we're going to average like the, you know, the nine surrounding pixels. Uh, together with uh, the central one, and uh, so you know, so so that's sort of a local computation. And if we expand that to a global computation with extend, uh, we can do a low pass filter of the entire image. So that will look you know, something like this. So uh, a local computation that just works on, on the neighboring pixels of, of an individual pixel can be sort of magically extended throughout the whole image. Uh, and we can do this again. So if I have a, a bitmap and I now want to extend something that you know just extracts the value and then subtracts uh, whatever the value of the low pass filter was, uh, I now get an edge detection function. So totally awesome. And all of that uh, stuff, like you know state machines and like you know bitmaps with edge detection and crazy stuff, all of that falls out of the fact that there's an isomorphism between curried and uncurried functions. And I think that's kind of, kind of awesome. Um, yeah, so, you know, we're basically making no sort of ad hoc uh, decisions. We're able to, to generate all of this structure just from this really simple fact about functions. Uh, okay, but most interesting adjunctions actually appear outside of the Haskell category. So I'm going to just do a little bit of sort of a refresher on, on category theory so we can talk about categories other than functions and types. Okay, uh, so starting with functions and types, if we imagine uh, we have, uh, you know, some types A, B, and C, and if we have a function uh, F that goes from A to B, and we have a function G that goes from B to C, then we have a composite function G goes F that goes from A to C. The implementation of that is, you know, lambda of x, g of f of x, right? Uh, super simple. And uh, and this diagram 
uh, this is the kind of thing that you see a lot of category theory, and we say that this diagram commutes, which means that all the paths from A to C in this diagram are the same. That is, uh, if we do F, and then we do G on the V that we got, that's the same as doing G goes F. And uh, composition of functions is associative. Uh, and we say that this diagram commutes. And now you all know what that means, right? So uh, that means that, that all the paths through this, through this diagram are the same. So if we, we can do F and then followed by G and then followed by H. And it doesn't matter if we sort of factor that as like, you know, uh, G compose F followed by H or F followed by G compose H. It's all just the function G compose H. H compose G compose F, right? That gets us from A to D, right? So function composition is associative. And for every uh, function, uh, I mean, for, sorry, for every type A, there's an identity function on A that does nothing. And what it means to do nothing is uh, sort of uh, made a little bit precise in these diagrams. Uh, so we say that this diagram commutes, uh, or this pair of diagrams uh, commute. So uh, doing the identity followed by f is the same as just doing f, and uh, doing f followed by the identity is the same as just doing f. Right? Super easy. Uh, so in general, a category has some objects. It has some arrows between those objects, and it has composition of arrows which is associative and has an identity. So obviously, uh, uh, type the category of Haskell types, where the objects are Haskell types. The arrows between the objects are functions. Composition between the arrows is function composition, uh, and which is associative and has an identity. Right? So uh, the, the category task is category. But we can talk about other categories as well. And, and one I want to talk about uh, today is uh, like a, a poset category. So if we imagine, for instance, like the uh, natural numbers or the integers. So A, B, and C are integers, say, and we, I want to say that there's an arrow from A to B exactly when A is less than or equal to B. And then there's an arrow from B to C exactly when there's an arrow from B to C, uh, sorry, when exactly when B is less than or equal to C. Right? So that's sort of the definition of what an arrow means this category. So arrows point upwards from smaller things to larger things. And uh, there, there's a composite arrow from A to C which is simply the fact that, uh, that the, this uh, relationship, less than or equal to the relationship, is uh, transitive. That is, if A is less than or equal to B, B is less than or equal to C, and A is certainly less than or equal to C. Right? So uh, if there's an arrow from A to B, there's an arrow from B to C, then there's also an arrow from A to C. And then there's an identity arrow on every A, like if A is, uh, represents an integer, uh, then uh, there's, there's an, the, every integer is less than or equal to itself. So for every A in our category, uh, there's an arrow from A to A. All right, so, so, the arrow, so the objects in this category are not types, they're like integers, actual concrete integers, and the arrows are, uh, so the objects are integers and the arrows are this less than or equal to relationship. The arrows point upwards, smaller and bigger things. And uh, yeah, so, Composition on these arrows is also associative. Like if we know that A is less than equal to B, B is less than equal to C, C is less than equal to D, then all of that amounts to the fact that A is less than equal to D, or B is less than equal to C, etc. Right, so that's all. Uh, all the paths for this diagram are in fact the same arrow. Great, so now we have that uh, preliminary. I want to show you another example of, uh, of an adjunction in that category. Uh, so let's say that X, Y, and Z are integers. Uh, and we're going to say that y is uh, larger than zero, so there's a positive integer. Really. Uh, sorry, y is certainly a positive integer. Uh, so th there's this uh, relationship between multiplication and division, which says that whenever uh, <laughs> z times y is less than or equal to x, z is less than or equal to x divided by y. Right, this is uh, just a, this is just the truth about uh, multiplication and division on the integers. Right, so division here might have some kind of remainder, right, which we're going to ignore. Right? So uh, what this is really saying is that if we take x, we divide by y, and then we multiply by y again, 
uh, we get something that's less than or equal to x, right? Because we divide by y, we might lose a remainder. We multiply by y again, uh, we won't necessarily get x again because we have lost the remainder, but we might get some. We will always get something that's less than or equal to x. And then conversely, uh, if we multiply by y and then divide by y, we'll get uh, set or bigger, right? And so this is starting to look sort of like what we had before. Right? So the this one-to-one -one relationship between these two arrows, or these, these two types of arrows, um, uh, up top, and this sort of unit and co-unit arrow in here as well. Right? Because uh, we can actually abstract out, like uh, multiply by y into a function, and divide by y into a function called g. And now it's starting to look a little more like, like one of those uh, relationships that we saw before. So if there's an arrow from f of z to x, there's a corresponding arrow from z to g of x. Right? And what that amounts to is that you know, if we divide and then multiply, we get something. We, we go below to where, where we started. If we multiply and divide, uh, we go above where we started. Right? So this so is that same kind of relationship. So the, the functions f and g here are functors. They're endofunctors inside of this category of integers. All right. So that's uh, yeah. So that's that's the integers. Um, I want to want to talk about but another way this comes up. Um, so let's imagine uh, just like think think about all the objects in this room. All right. So uh, if we we think about ways of grouping those objects together in sort of ad hoc ways. Um, like, let's say, you know, I want to take like that backpack and that chair over there as a group, as a sort of a collection of things. Or like those four chairs over there are a collection. Uh, and I want to say that there is a subtype, uh, subset relationship. So if I have a collection C1 and a collection C2, if, uh, if uh, C2 contains all of C1, then uh, C1 is a sub-collection of C2. So like, those two chairs are contained in those four chairs. And then, so I want to say that this forms a category uh, where you know, every such group is a subgroup of itself, or, or, or sub collection of itself. And uh, we have this sort of subset relationship between these collections. And there's an arrow from one collection uh, to a bigger one, which is a super, super collection. And then we might have sort of an arsenal of descriptions sort of abstract descriptions or theorems, if you will, about these sort of models or about the, about the concrete things that we're looking at. Um, so then the, the abstract description uh, of, you know, like some, some like four chairs over there, it might be like chair, or there might be like white chair, or, uh, you know, something like that. Or there's like, you know, people, is, a, is like a description, and then uh, which, which we want to apply to like all the people. In here. And uh, I want to say that there's going to be a relationship between these descriptions. So when when D1 uh, is more specific than D2, then, then D1 is going to point to D2. There's going to be an arrow from D1 to D2, right? So it's going to be a sort of a sub description. Great. So now we have these sort of two categories that are you know not really the same. Uh, but uh, I want to have two functors. So one functor that goes uh, from concretes to descriptions, and one that goes from descriptions to concretes. And, uh, and the way that's going to work is that if I, uh, so, so, so examples is going to give me all of the examples of a particular description. So like if I have person as my description, and I say examples of person, I want to get all the people, right? And if I say, uh, if I have some, uh, some concrete object or group of objects in the room, and I say describe, I want to get the most specific description. I want to get like the narrowest possible description of that, of that thing, okay? <clears throat> and so what's, what's going to happen is that if I, if I say like, oh, give me all the examples of B, and then describe, like, give me the most specific description of, of you know, uh, of all of those examples. 
I might actually get a more specific description than when I started. You know, like if I, I start with some uh, like a pair of chairs and I say, you know, give me some exa uh, give me some examples. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I start with uh, a chair and I say, give me some examples of chairs and give me all the chairs. And then I say, okay, give me the most specific description I have. Then, it's, then it might say like, well, white plastic chair, which is more specific than what I started with. And then conversely, if I say like, you know, describe these two chairs, it's going to give you a chair or white plastic chair. And I say, okay, well, give me the examples and it's going to give you all the chairs and not just the two I started with. Okay, so I get strictly larger things. So a question? Yeah. Yes. Well, or the, the the entire set of all the the universe that we're concerned with, the sort of universe of discourse. Right? Like, if, if the universe of discourse is just this room, for instance, then I just want the chairs in this room. It's it's not a very yeah. So the examples you're asking, the examples function, does it give you the, the elements or all subsets? Uh, it should give me the largest, the sort of most generous set, like all of the things that are possibly examples of that. Like everything could possibly fall under. Like if I say, like, give me examples of thing, that would be like totally intractable, and it would give me like all the models of, of everything. But if I, if I say, you know, um, yeah, so, so we can think of this as being like models and, and theorems. So we have like, a, a, you know, a super general theorem that like, where everything is true, and then, you know, everything's going to be modeled. Uh, cool. Yeah, so, and that stands in this kind of relationship as well. Like, if I describe B, e, that's going to be more specific than, than the concept C. And then if I uh, ask for the examples of the concept C, I should get something big. Than e, right? So this this uh, kind of thing stands in a, a junction as well. Right? So yeah. So you can see how this is the co-unit and the unit. Right? I go from describing examples of D to D and from E to examples of describing B. So one of these is a co-unit and a co-monad, and the other one is a unit and a monad. And they stand together in a, in a, a junction like this. Right? Kind of awesome. Uh, all right, so, you know, that, that's just another one of these. Uh, so there's a pattern recognition exercise. It's one of these you to like, start seeing this everywhere. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take this thing here. Uh, so I want to write this function index of, which, uh, given an equality on A, and an element of some list, um, or it might be in that, in that list, and have an A and a, and a list of A. And I want to say, where is this element in this list? Uh, well, you know, I want to get an integer. But, but this is not really going to work, right? Because that element might not be in that list. Right? So what do I do in that, in that case? Uh, so, you know, there are lots of, lots of things that you could do. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, lots of people, you know, lots of languages do this kind of thing. I go, well, I'm going to return negative one. That's going to be like my sort of sentinel value. Or infinity, negative infinity, not a number. Or like, you know, just return null. It's just going to blow up at some point. But uh, yeah, so that's just going to be like a type, a type for all AA. But uh, if we really stop and think about this, like what are we really after here? What we're really after is to return some, some special value of our book. Whatever return type we want to return. We, should, we want to return some sort of sentinel or special value. So we want our return type to be a pointed type. Because we want to have uh, you know, sort of a pointer in that, into that type. It's like, that's a special value. Okay? Um, so yeah, a pointed, a pointed set is just like a regular set, except it has a, a sort of a distinguished element. Uh, and so the question then becomes, can we, in a totally formulaic, universal way that works for all types in all languages forever turn any type into a pointed type making no ad hoc choices whatsoever like we're never going to say like oh this is negative one or like i'm going to add null to every type maybe 
Maybe. Maybe, Maybe. yeah. Maybe <laughs> is the answer. But, but how do we know that? Like, that's what we did. Why is it, why is it maybe? Yeah, because like, oh, we, we already know this, and nothing is the point. Nothing, nothing is the point, that's right. <laughs> Which is analogous to this talk. <laughs> but so, so we can actually discover like why we want maybe here. Uh, because there is um, a functor that goes from the point to type to the types, which it, it, we say is forgetful. Um, it forgets the point. Uh, <laughs> I said, uh, I, yeah, make your own jokes. <laughs> so, so the forgetful functor u, uh, if I say u of x and x is a point to type, then uh, what I get out is a regular type that doesn't have a point. Right? Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget that, that whole structure. Does it mean that x is no longer? It's not an element of the return type, or just you can't figure out what x is. Oh, so this is a functor. It doesn't uh, doesn't operate on the elements. It operates on the type. Right, but I'm saying, sorry. I mean, the point, the point is an element of some type. Oh, yeah. So the point is going to be an element of x. Yeah. But uh, you're not going to be able to ask what is the point of u of x right? because it's not a type. But it turns out that this uh, functor uh, u has a left adjoint. Uh, which goes from the types to the pointed types. And for any type x, no matter what type that is, p of x is going to be a pointed type. And we're going to be able to get that just like totally for free. Um, and so there's going to be some value of type p of x that's going to be the point. OK, so uh, these two uh, types are going to stand in a one-to-one -one relationship. There's going to be What's the relationship between the arrows from Q of A to B and the arrows from A to U of B, where P is our finds our point type and U forgets the point of, of B. So the blue things here are, are homomorphisms in the pointed types. That is, they're functions that preserve the points. As if you apply uh, one of these blue arrows to a pointed type, you should get the and if you have the point, you should get the point in the other type, right? And the red arrows are just ordinary functions. Uh, so we can actually just, you know, take away that u because we just, in, you know, Haskell appointed types type. So we can just say that whenever we have a function from a to b, we have a function of p of a to b, and vice versa. Okay. And so uh, we can just uh, sort of turn the crank on the adjunction and say, like, well, what we want is this then, uh, this sort of uh, isomorphism, where if we have a point at b and we have a function from a to b, we have a function from p of a to b. And if we have a function from P of A to B, we have a function from A to B. So those are our left and right adjuncts. And uh, we should also get a co-unit and a unit, right? Um, which you know we can simply get by passing the identities to right and, uh, and left adjunct. And so co-unit uh, should allow us to go from P of B to B for any point is at B. And it should allow us to go from A to P of A from any type A, even if that type is not pointed. The definition of the left adjunct, we get to take advantage of the fact that the function preserves the point. In the definition of right adjunct, left adjunct, well, left adjunct. doesn't that arrow have to preserve the point? Yeah. So, uh, so in the in the left adjunct, the argument is a is a point instead of a point. Right. It has to preserve the points. We do have to use that. We do have to use that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just, uh, sorry, one more. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, right adjunct pointed A, right? It's what is it pointed B? So, Missing something here, and you might explain. Uh, right adjuncts, yeah. B is pointed, A is not. Okay. A is just a regular type, and P of A gives us a pointed type oh, for that. Right. Great. So we can actually get rid of that pointed uh, uh, constraint because like, a pointed B is just a value. It's just a B. Okay. So then we just say, well, right adjunct takes a B function from A to B, a P of A, and gives us B. And uh, it's, this is should start, be starting to look pretty familiar. And we can actually like uh, just keep turning the crank on this and say like, well, whatever that is, it's just a new type, and it's anything that has that structure. Right? Like if we if we just have an implementation of this full p thing, like it takes a b and, and a function of a to b, and our p of a, whatever that is, uh, if we can get a b out of that, that that is our point set. And it turns out that you know any implementation of this. Is going to be a to maybe. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we, we just you know, th this is maybe it's a, a the church encoding of maybe. And so if we just uh, sort of uh, to turn the, the functions into tags, uh, we 
we turn this into an actual data type, then you know we have maybe, which is either nothing or just A, where the point is, is nothing. So maybe of A is a pointed set, any set A. And uh, the right adjunct is the maybe function, right? So that folds the, the maybe given a default value of type B and then a function from A to B that uh, operates on the A if we have it. Right? So we give it like two handlers. And the unit is just, right? Totally awesome. And keep turning the crank on this and now we get join for our maybe monad. So join is this cool unit. Uh, you might ask like, why is that not F map? Well, because the forgetful factor is sort of invisible here. Um, and then duplicates uh, goes from maybe A to maybe maybe A, and that's just that unit. And so maybe is a co-monad in the category point types. Uh, and then, so we have our answer. Like, what we want to do is not return negative one or infinity or not a number or for all a, a like null. Uh, what we want to return is an element of Point. We know that because it's the it's joint. Yes, so we know that that is the case because maybe is left adjoint to the functor that forgets points. And so because it's left, it's adjoint, so remember it goes the other way. So the forgetful functor goes into the types from the pointed types, and then the adjoint will go the other way into the pointed types from the types. So it's not an exact inverse, but it will find us like the best possible answer, if it exists. And in general, um, uh, so, so, so this is the, so maybe is the free pointed type, uh, and in general, free functors are left adjunct to forgetful ones. And, and we can keep doing this, like we can take, uh, well, if we, you know, we have a category of monoids, and we want to figure out, like, well, how do we simulate monoids in the types? And we can just say, well, what's left adjunct to the functor that forgets that a type is a monoid? And that turns out to be the free monoid, which is uh, uh, isomorphic to a, uh, a terminating list. And uh, we can do a little bit monads as well. We have a category of monads, and we would say, well, how do we simulate the monads in types? And we just say, well, free monad for any functor f. Uh, I'm sorry, why do we simulate monads in the functors? So <coughs> we can just generate a free monad for any functor. And, and that works in exactly the same way. Like if I put up, put up the slides to generate that example, it would look exactly the same except it would be natural transformations instead of functions. Um, okay, so last example. If I have two objects A and B in my category, I don't know what my category is, but uh, can I approximate a notion of both A and B, whatever that means? And this should work universally and identically for any A and B, and preferably should work for any category in which this makes sense. Don't give away the answer. <laughs> Okay, so like, hey, both A and B, does that, does that work? Like, uh, and and what, what does that mean? Right? So we can say something ad hoc, like say, you know, uh, like you say we're in the category of sets and we say like, well, A and B is like, you know, I have an A and I have like, for all R, I can turn a function into, uh, into you know, R into B or something. But I want to make no ad hoc decisions here at all. So for any two categories, C and D, there is this thing called the product category, uh, C cross D. And uh, that is a super simple construction. The objects in that category are just pairs of the objects from the underlying categories. So if I have an object uh, from C and then I have an object from D, that is an object in C cross D. So any two objects coming together is an object in the product category. And if I have uh, pairs of arrows, one from C and one from D, I have an arrow in, in uh, C cross D, uh, and you know the the arrows have to line up pairwise. Right? So so it's really just like putting those two categories together side by side. That's all this is doing. So if I can put two categories together side by side like this, um, I I can uh, you know I have this notion of sort of both two of two of things. Right? Okay. So for any category C, there's this thing called the diagonal functor which uh, given you know, an object C in my category C, uh, it will construct an object in the C cross C category, which is just C and then C again, right? It's, it's just the, that same object twice. So that's how it operates on objects. And the way this functor operates on functions 
is that it will take uh, my function f and it will simply duplicate it. Uh, so now I have f and f, like side by side. Right? So this is a functor from c to c cross c that just puts c next to itself. That's all it does. So uh, like a super simple, easy construction to make. But it turns out that this thing has a right adjoint, which is uh, going to find us our product if it exists. And we can just uh, sort of like start turning the crank on this thing. Uh, okay, so it has a right adjoint. That means that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between these arrows. So, uh, you know, I have an arrow from like, you know, diagonal of A or delta of A to this object uh, B with C, which is an object in the product category. Uh, if I have an arrow like that, uh, I put the double arrows to make, make sure we know that that's an arrow in the product category. Uh, if we can get out of that an arrow in the regular category C, uh, from A to pi of, of uh, B C, whatever whatever that is, whatever pi is, we don't know what that is yet, but it's going to take an object in the product category and turn it into our product of B and C, whatever that is. Um, and so I want to expand out this delta functor. So delta of A is really just A, a and A again. So that's a, an arrow from, you know, a comma A to B comma C in the product category. And then I want to expand out also the pi. That should find us our product of B and C, whatever that is. And I'm going to call that B cross C. Okay? So the only thing we don't know what is in here is B cross C, and the adjunction will allow us to find it. Uh, so this arrow on the left-hand side uh, is in the product category, but I want to now turn that into uh, I want to take a view of it as if we're in the underlying category. So it's really two functions, a function from you know, AA to BC, uh, sorry, an arrow from AA to BC in the product category is actually two arrows, one from AB and the other one from AC, so they're sort of next to each other. And so there should be an isomorphism between these things now. And uh, so what this is saying is that B cross C is some object which for all A, uh, there's an arrow of, uh, out of A uh, exactly when, right, this, so, so that isomorphism means exactly when there's an arrow from A to C and there's an arrow from A to B. So if there's an arrow from A to B and an arrow from A to C, then for every such A, there's an arrow from A to B plus C. Right? So if we just say, well, what if we pass the identity on, you know, on the, uh, the right-hand side here, then we say that, well, there must be an arrow from B plus C to B, an arrow from, from B cross C to C as well. Right, so now I've just passed the identity arrow from the right over to the left, and that gives me a pair of arrows. Uh, so now A and, and B cross C are, are like they have uh, identified with each other. So great. Um, so yeah, it's going to be some object B cross C, which has an arrow into B, that has an arrow into C, and for every other A that has an arrow into both B and C, there's going to be an arrow from A to B cross C. And so this diagram is going to commute. So that's another way of saying that. Um, and this turns out to be a product diagram. And uh, so, so the, the projections out of pi 1 and pi 2 go from our product into the components, B and C. And then for every A, there's going to be these, these uh, for every A that has arrows delta 1 and delta 2 into, both, into B and C, respectively, there's going to be a unique arrow into B cross C. And uh, in Haskell, the product in the Hask category turns out to be uh, the tuple type. So uh, B cross C is, is paired uh, B and C. So it's the Cartesian product of sets uh, B and C. And the projections are first and second. Okay. How did you know to look for a right triangle? How did I know to write? Uh, talk to me after. Uh, how did I know to look for a right um, Okay. Um, so that works in Haskell, but what about a totally different category? Like, can we find this in, in, in some other category that we've looked at? Well, let's look at the poset category with the integers, or with like sets, or like concepts, or groupings of things in the room, or whatever. So they're, they're going to be in what, this one to one relationship that whenever there's a, you know, an arrow from A to B and an arrow from A to C, uh, then there's an arrow from A to B plus, and vice versa. Right? And, uh, there's going to be this sort of co-unit which says that, well, we have both, a, we have these two projections. 
there's going to be a projection from B cross C to B, uh, projections from B cross C to C. That is, you know, and in the post category, that means that B cross C is going to be less than or equal to B. B cross C is going to be less than or equal to C. And this is also saying that for every A that is less than both B and C, or under both B and C, uh, B cross C is going to be above that A. So it's going to be a, uh, a lower bound right, for B and C. <coughs> But it's going to be the greatest such bound, right? So, so the arrows here are, are you know, sub, sub relationships, they're less than or equal to relationships, right? So, B cross C in the like the integer category is going to be the greatest lower bound of B and C. And if we just flip all the arrows, we get the least upper bound, which is uh, so. So this is going to be our product. The least uh, greatest lower bound is going to be our product. And if we flip all the arrows, we get the co-product, which is the greatest lower bound. Um, and in general, uh, least upper bounds are left adjoint to the diagonal functor, which, are, which is in turn left adjoint to the greatest lower bound. Um, and in, uh, or, or in general, it's going to be sums are left adjoint to diagonals, which are left adjoint to products. And in Haskell, uh, you know, the product was the pair, and the co-product is going to be the either. And we can do this exact same thing in, uh, in Haskell. Like if we flip all the arrows on the product, we get either. So, uh, yeah, uh, adjunctions are awesome. And uh, they also compose, which is even more awesome. So whenever F is left adjoint to G, and P is left adjoint to Q, then the composite functor FP is left adjoint to GQ. And so we can keep doing this. And uh, if we know any two of F, G, P, and Q, we can generate the other two, which uh, people are you now using to do generic programming and, uh, and uh, program inference and stuff, which is uh, totally great. And I encourage you to check out these papers. Uh, there's generic programming with injunctions by, by Ralph Vincent. And uh, it's an awesome thing called Galculator, which is a functional prototype of a Galois connection-based proof system. Uh, so a Galois connection is another word for a junction. And uh, so it's a specific kind of a junction in the POSA uh, So um, I want to encourage you to look for junctions whenever you want to generate a solution that naturally fits your problem. Um, and uh, I want to say that a junction sort of resolve the tension between uh, trade-offs, like uh, in the example of uh, you know, concrete groupings of things and descriptions, the junction there sort of resolves the tension between like being too specific and being too general. Uh, and so there's going to be like this space or the surface where the problem space and the solution space meet. Uh, and and that, that sort of surface in between it is going to kind of like generate all of the solutions that make sense. So they're sort of the optimal solutions. Uh, it's optimal sort of like expressiveness, not necessarily like that's what you actually want to do, right? Uh, it, it's, and so this, the tension is like between expressiveness and like predictability or, or analyzability. And then the adjunction resolves basically for you that, that tension. Or it will find you a space where that, where that tension can uh, So yeah, whenever you're looking for a general and natural, elegant and beautiful, efficient solution, uh, try to express the problem as a functor and then just find its adjunct. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what's that question? All the examples here are for sort of things where the solution is already known, like either and tuple. Yeah. Is there an example that you have where uh, looking for the adjunction helps you find an elegant solution to a problem? Oh, the question is, uh, all, all of these are like sort of already known, like the well-known examples of adjunctions. Like, have I used this to find the, like a novel solution to a problem? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, I want to, I want to like show this pattern and uh, encourage you to, to look for adjunctions where you can find them. Following up on that, do you know that a, a, a solution to a problem that was found through this method? It's like maybe no, knowing to use a maybe in that case. We didn't need to use adjunctions to know that. We all knew that we didn't need adjunctions for this talk. But like, are there, maybe this is a proof, but are there actual solutions that are, were specifically found using this method? Either? Yeah, if you check out these papers, uh, you know, there are, yeah, yeah like, like basically, uh, Generating programs 
you by looking for a junction. So, so yeah, totally. Uh, there, there are examples of like generating folds over, over lists uh, just from the three uh, Yeah. Are these slides online? Are these slides online? Uh, no, but I will put them on. For sure. uh, yeah, any other questions? Cool. Thank you very much.